Their idea of pest control was um, was very rudimentary. So, uh, so one book was recommending to uh, to cure aphids on your peach tree. You should inject the stems with mercury. That was Vicky Cook discussing Georgian pest control. There's really no history of that period, so it gave me a free reign. So when people say, oh, it wasn't like that, I say, were you a Hexos? Were you there? And that was Wilbur Smith talking about his latest historical novel. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. This year saw Hampton Court Palace open its restored Georgian kitchen garden to the public, recreating the pathways and planting patterns laid down by the palace's Georgian gardeners. We sent our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman, to meet kitchen garden keeper Vicky Cook and find out more about the garden restoration project, as well as sample some of the season's produce. So Vicky, we're in the um, sort of recreated Georgian garden um, mm-hmm. at Hampton Court Palace. You're the kitchen garden keeper. Mm-hmm. It's quite yep. an interesting title. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> what does that actually mean? What do you actually do here? Uh, well, I'm responsible for maintaining a display of fruit and vegetables that were in, in keeping um, with the Georgian era, which is sort of when this garden was, yeah. was designed to recreate. Um, and to, yeah, get some nice produce and have a nice display and show people all about historical fruit and vegetables. And how long has this recreated garden been here now? Oh, it's a very new project. We started work on it, well, the gardeners started work on it in February. Okay, um, all right. So this is its first sort of growing season um, in action. So uh, it's very it's new. like it's flourishing quite well. <laughs> yeah, we've had a great weather this year. Yes, sunshine. I mean, it's raining today, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. but it's probably quite good for them, I, um, I yes. imagine. Um, just tell me a little bit about the history of, of this particular site that, that the garden's on. Well, the site was originally uh, Henry VIII's jousting arena, so okay. where they would have had the grand tournaments and the big jousts. Uh, but when that sort of fell out of favour, um, it was disused for a while until uh, William and Mary came along and decided to make um, Hampton Court their principal residence. Uh, and as they were going to be spending all their time here with all their courtiers, uh, they needed to feed them all. And so they uh, decided they wanted a kitchen garden. And so, um, so the original jousting arena was divided into six compartments uh, to make wa- more uh, wall space for mm-hmm. exotic fruit and um, fruit crops um, and yes so we've just recreated one of those six compartments and so what sort of things are you growing here this year we've got quite a, a range of crops here um, just looking around me I can see uh, squashes I can see chicories and um, and endives um, parsley nasturtiums salsify uh, we've got lots of beans of various sort both runner beans yeah. and french beans um, and, and they're all sort of authentic. These would have been grown in sort of the Georgian era, would they? Yeah, these are all crops that would have been grown in the Georgian times. Now, it's sort of harder to find varieties mm. that date back, but we've got a few varieties that date back to that period. Um, but, but they're all crop types that would have been known and grown back in the, back in the day. OK, and I mean, how do you know um, what was grown here originally? What sources have you been using to kind of to, to replant this garden? Well, sadly, none of, the, none of the sources for this actual garden survive. So uh, although we had a, an overhead drawing to, to work on the, sort of the layout and the design of it, no records of what was planted here has ever survived. Uh, so, but we're going back to contemporary books. Um, there was a lot written in that sort of early part of the 1700s, uh, gardening guides, manuals, what gentlemen should have in their gardens. Um, and <laughs> one, um, one book that's been really useful, it's uh, written in 1706. Uh, yeah. And it was by, uh, well, it was a translation of various French works, and it was translated by London Wise, who were the head gardeners here at Hampton Court. Um, so uh, 
although they translated most of this from French, they realised that the, the fruit and vegetable section wouldn't be suitable for an English garden. So they included their own chapter yeah. all about uh, fruit and vegetables that would be suitable for the gentleman to have in his garden. Okay. So, and what, what in particular did it, does it mention? What sort of vegetables and fruits? Well, a lot that you'd recognise, but a lot that I w- it had a scratch in our heads. <laughs> it's got rock and bowls and heart's horns and, oh, right. and scurvy grass and, and, and skirrets and things like that. So and are you growing some of those now? Yes, yes. We've managed to trace, down, trace the seed and we've got them growing away in the garden here. Okay, and what, and what sort of things are you making, some, some sort of authentic dishes out of these? How are they being used when you're, when you're sort of harvesting these, these vegetables? Uh, well, some of it's going to a market store, so we're selling it, some of it direct. Okay. But we are supplying uh, the kitchens here with... With, with some produce so they um, we have big Tudor kitchens here yeah. on site and so we supply some um, some herbs and some vegetables for their displays uh, but also they do cookery demonstrations uh, ah, okay. so they've been quite interested in getting some of the more unusual things yeah. that you, know, you can't just go and buy from Wakefield <laughs> yeah I'm trying to think what you'd, um, what you'd use scurvy grass <laughs> yeah exactly it's <laughs> <That's laughs> absolutely appetising <laughs> no but probably good for you <laughs> yeah, we've got lots of vitamin C in it um, and um, it, was this type of garden kind of usual for the for the time? I mean, obviously, it sounds quite big, and you say that William Mary had, were, you know, they wanted this here. But is there evidence of this sort of thing in other royal palaces and, and things like that? Yes, I mean, every royal palace would have had a garden, uh, you know, a kitchen garden. Or yes, less. Um, I mean, you were you had lots of people to feed, um, and as the sort of boom in fresh produce and fresh vegetables came in in the 17th century, um, people needed to supply it, yeah. so um, it paid to have your own. So would it be many wealthy people who would have been eating this type of thing, sort of fruit and vegetables? You know, if you were a poor person, would you have been able to grow this type of thing in your in your own garden? If people had their own little patch of land, then they would have been growing yeah. things. Uh, probably they would have had a different diet. You know, the the rich would have eaten sort of different things to the poor. Um, yeah. One of the things about this garden is that it would have been intensively managed, had lots of gardeners, and they would have done a lot of things like forcing and delaying crops uh, to get an earlier or an out-of-season crop. So, um, so the peasants would have eaten locally and in season, whereas if you could afford it, you, uh, you yeah. ate out-of-season. So. Okay. And I mean, how have you decided how, how it's laid out as well? The, the basic layout yeah. was... Um, was all from this plan of 1736 okay. uh, that we, that's, um, I think it was a cartographer and he did lots of overhead drawings and paintings of palaces and grand houses uh, and so you can there's one of it's got the whole of Hampton Court on it and you can see just in the in the background there's the kitchen garden mm-hmm. and it had this layout which has got a cross shaped central path through the middle uh, and then you've got quarters and each quarter is then subdivided by uh, paths going one way and paths going another way so we've got 260 rectangular beds here for the vegetables Uh, and then around the edge we've got fruit uh, fruit bands and so they're very little now you have to use your imagination (laughs) but these apple trees will eventually uh, frame as as, um, a sort of globe standard dwarf apples uh, and we've got them interspersed with soft fruit and um, and this very formal box edging around the edge. Hello, little, yes, I can yeah, see that now. For that sort of formal, formal garden feel. So even though it's a kitchen garden, it would have been used by sort of members of the household or sort of the royal family or whatever for walking round. So okay. it's not hidden away at the bottom of the garden as they would have done in the later era. Mm. You know, the Victorians sort of wanted to keep all the mess and the noise yes, and the gardeners out mm. of sight. Whereas we are right next to the palace here. You know, yeah. It butts onto the kitchens. Um, so it would have been straight from, straight from the garden and into the kitchen. And so it had to look attractive uh, yeah. because it would have been used by the, the, the family of the house. So, and how long do you think it will be before um, you say it's, it's been going since February? I mean, it looks remarkably sort of well established, <laughs> you know, just for a few months. How long do you think it will be before it starts to look like it might have looked in sort of you know, mm. the Georgian era? Yeah, I think if we give it sort of maybe four, three, four, five years, that'll mm. give enough time for these trees to get more of a more height and more shape to them. Yeah, because um, box heads take quite a long time to grow, don't they? The box is very <laughs> slow growing. Yeah, so that'll be a couple of years before the little plants meet in the middle and make a proper hedge. Yeah, um, and the uh, yes, and the apples need to sort of make their their full shape, and that will screen off actually a lot more of what's going off. Yeah. in the vegetable section in the middle. Um, so what have you harvested this year? What, what have you sort of seen? What's done, done really well? Well, What's I've been pleasantly surprised this year. We've mm. had some great weather. So yes. we've been harvesting melons from our um, specially constructed raised melon beds. Okay. Um, I've had quite a reasonable crop of aubergines, which I've been quite excited <laughs> about. Uh, and the outdoor tomatoes have done very well. Uh, but also it's been interesting to grow some things that I've never grown before, like the, uh, the chicories, mm. the endives. Uh, and they, they've been fantastic. They've been yeah. a, a very long season. 
And some of the more unusual um, seeds, I mean, where, where would you sort of get these from? Where have you, where have you found them? Uh, well, partly, um, so what I used to do before coming here, mm. I used to work for a charity which preserved heritage UK vegetable varieties. So, um, so I did have a bit of insider knowledge yes. about where to get these seeds. Uh, and I did leave my previous job with... Uh, a, a few packets a of stash. Seeds, shall we say. <laughs> um, and what we'll try and do is um, is save seeds from them in the garden. So that's yeah. another skill that they would have used widely back in the day. If you wanted to keep a variety going, you'd have had to know how to get seeds from it yeah. to re-sow the next year. Um, so that's been one source. But you can, if you do your research, find some other suppliers. That, um, and a lot of what we're doing is um, a wildflower seeds. So they would have been okay. bringing wildflowers into uh, the kitchen garden. Um, and so things like the, the hearts horn and the scurvy grass mm. uh, you can find them growing wild by the coastline but we've just brought them into the garden okay so so where next for the garden what what are your plans for it over the next couple of years are you going to sort of be rotating some of the things that you're growing or adding any new new varieties yes. well the research will be ongoing yeah um, we'll have hopefully plenty of wet days over the winter <laughs> to go and sit down with some of the some of the old his history books. Um, yeah. We had to, um, we spent a great day at the RHS Lindley Library, which is okay. in central London, uh, and that has a room, especially sealed in room with a special environment, which has all of the sort of wow. 15th, 16th, 17th century gardening books in there. So it would be great to spend another day down there and, yeah. and look for more, you know, different types of crops that they were growing. You know, some of the husbandry techniques mm. um, are sort of interesting, if maybe not repeatable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was going to say, have you followed any sort of um, original you know way of gardening from from the time or have you been sort of using modern day methods to to, to farm it um it's a bit of a, a mm. mixture i have to say some of the old techniques um one should take with a pinch of salt their <laughs> idea of pest control was um was very rudimentary so uh, so one book was recommending to uh, to cure aphids on your peach tree you should inject the stems with mercury <laughs> I think we don't, we don't recommend yes, people I would not recommend home. anyone does at home um, and they, they seem to think that most uh, most maladies were caused by foul winds from the east so, okay. um, so the general advice was to, to light a very smoky bonfire just downwind and, uh, when, the, when the winds blow from the east and that would hopefully clear away all the foul humours uh, of the garden but, um, but other things I found have uh, been very interesting you know, there was, as I said before, they were so expert at uh, forcing crops mm. um, to get to get an early crop. It'd be interesting to try and recreate that. So we've got some hotbeds, and they would have used a lot of um, horse manure, very fresh horse manure, and the heat as that broke down would create the extra heat needed to, to bring crops on very early. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it was said that you should be able to get melons as early as May um, Gosh. because they were, they were so expert at doing this. And that, that and, was the yeah. sign of prestige, really. So it would be just trial and error, really, just seeing what worked and, and what didn't work. Yeah, I think, yes, we will we will try and try some of these old techniques. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I can't promise in, in May. I think that might be up to <laughs> That's your aim for next year. I'll come back next May and see whether they're done. Um, and how would this sort of garden have been run? I mean, would there have been a head gardener, um, somebody sort of overseeing the whole thing? Yes, there would have been a head gardener, and they would have been held in high esteem, the kitchen gardener, because, again, it's... it's um, it's quite essential to your sort of livelihood if you've got to, you know, to get fresh produce um, out of the garden. So yes, they were they were sort of only a couple of rungs below the butler in sort of seniority um, okay. of these old households. Oh, right. uh, so it would have had a head gardener. It would have had um, well, this particular garden had. 20 full-time gardeners looking oh. after it um, but as well as that it would have had a host of um, weeder women who were <laughs> paid a pittance to come in and do all the sort of the, the, the manual weeding work yeah. uh, and it would have probably had a lot of boys um, to come and squash caterpillars and go out with their butterfly nets and catch the uh, catch the butterflies and, and scare off pigeons and you know just do all the sort of really menial work okay. so it would have been a, a very busy place yeah the day. yes I mean, was food very important to the Georgians, would you say, sort of more than any other period? Or, you know, this type of garden, was it... I mean, it sounds like it's on quite a huge scale, if this is only one-sixth of what it would have mm. been. Is that, you know... Have, can you see that in any other era, like, the, you know, Tudors or...? Uh, I think that, from from my knowledge, which I, I confess isn't complete, honestly, <laughs> um, they, they didn't really eat so much in the way of vegetables in the Tudor time. It was mostly sort of a meat and, a meat and bread-based diet. Yeah. Um, but towards the end of the 1600s, people started recognising that this maybe wasn't, you know, wasn't the best way that vegetables actually were probably quite good for you. Yeah. Um, another early source who's been really interesting are the diaries and the books of John Evelyn. Okay. Who was, uh, was a writer and a, and a philosopher and essayist um, at the end of the 1600s. Uh, and he was a very early vegetarian. Uh, and he 
partly thought that the meat-based diet was what had, what had killed his wife early, and so he was very uh, he was a proponent of eating vegetables, getting your greens down you. Yeah. Um, and we see a big sort of upsurge in the use of green veg at this time. So it's quite fashionable. Yeah, it became a fashionable thing. Um, another reason I think was that um, we got. Um, so new technology came over from Holland, uh, and it was the technology of using uh, green manure crops uh, and soil fertility building crops. So before that, um, you know, if you don't add fertility to soil, you can, you can exhaust it very quickly. Uh, but in the mid-1600s, uh, about the time of Cromwell, I think, the Dutch settlers came over, they brought this green manure technique, and all of a sudden you're adding fertility back in the soil, and you can grow much better crops, much better yields, you know, and a, and a wider variety. So and how, were they, how were they doing that? What was the, kind of the technique? The te well, it's just what you can see over there. You see these, uh, those fine clover beds? Yes. Um, that's been grown as a crop, and we'll take the tops off and just compost those, but it's okay. the roots that are doing the work. Um, they, they are taking nitrogen from the air mm -hmm. um, and then adding it to the soil sort of through their roots. And so oh, right. uh, at, when we turn it in over the winter, um, it will rot down and the next year we'll have a very nitrogen-rich soil for the next crop. So, um, and, um, yeah, it, it's one of the things that sort of brought on the first sort of big agricultural yeah. um, revolution. All of a sudden we were getting a lot more productive um, crop-wise in that time. And we're sort of coming to the end of the sort of summer season now. Have you been? Have you already started harvesting? I suppose you probably have quite yes. a lot. Oh yes, we've been um, picking harvesting uh, and selling for the last couple of months now. It's been um, been highly productive, um, but we're just starting to put some of the winter crops in. So we'll try and keep the garden looking interesting. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're sowing lots of things like the corn salads. Um, winter cresses, mm. um, winter lettuces, things like the endives will sit over the winter time. So, um, so it should look sort of interesting, full, full of stuff to look yeah. at. Yeah, I mean, do they have any, any, I mean, it's all very open. Do they have, you know, we're sort of used to having things in greenhouses and, you know, just to kind of keep things mm. warm over the winter, things like that. Do they have any sort of way of, of keeping things going through the winter that perhaps you might be using or...? Uh, well, they would have used... So the era that this garden is covering is sort of the late part of the 1600s yeah. um, to the sort of mid part of the 1700s. Um, and that's when glass start was starting to be used in the garden. Uh, so the early period, they didn't really have the technology to make no. panes. Uh, they were just using small leaded lights. Uh, so the only real way of, of keeping things going was using sort of these manure hotbeds, um, sort of cup, which really just extends your season a bit at either end. Uh, but then towards the sort of the early 1700s, you start seeing more and more cold frames come in. So not quite your, your big Victorian glass house yet. No. Uh, but they had things called frame yards, which would have been an area similar in similar scale to this, okay. uh, about an acre, which would have had lots and lots of low uh, glass-covered um, raised frames on which they'd have grown things like the cucumbers and the melons in there. And that, that, they had that here, did they? Yes, it's, um, they've got one at Hampton Court, but now it's where our plant nursery is. So oh, it's okay. in large glass houses. Now. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we've got a few herbs in this bed that uh, you probably won't recognise, or you certainly don't see in a herb garden so much anymore. Uh, this plant here is called tansy. Mm -hmm. uh, pick a leaf. So have a, have a just a rub and a sniff because it's got a very strong Ooh. acrid flavour. And to mm, our nose, yeah. it's quite unpleasant. Oh well, this would have been used um, to flavour egg dishes. They would have made sort of tansy mm. omelettes. It was a really popular thing. Uh, I guess strong flavours were popular because it maybe disguised some of the <laughs> some of the nastier, nastier um, flavours mm. that could have been in food. But, um, but yes, yeah, so tansy was certainly a popular plant. Um, all through the sort of 1600s and into the early part of the 1700s. Um, you say it's quite. You don't really find it around today too much. Not, not as an edible plant. No. No. Um, you see, you see it as a as a weed. Really, I think most people would see it as a bit of a weed. Yeah, um, it's got that sort of the round yellow. Yeah, um, it's related. It's in the flowers. daisy family, so mm. um, it's sort of got those little daisy flowers, but without the white petals on the edge. So yeah, just the inner bit. And what else have we got in this herb? So these, herb here. Um, these two are savouries. We've got some winter savoury and some summer savoury. Um, you see the summer savoury is starting to go over and the winter savoury is starting to you know, come, come into season. But um, pick a couple of leaves. Has a well, as you say, it's Ooh, a, that's more of a it's a very savoury, lemony type yeah, of smell. Um, it's somewhere smell. between a thyme and a and a mint. Ooh, it's also sort of sick. yeah. Um, and this would have been used to flavour bean dishes. Oh, um, right, okay. In fact, I think the German name translates literally as bean herb. 
So, um, so it's the yes, goes very well. With That's rather nice, actually. Things. Yeah, really lovely mm. um, and really easy to grow. And um, yes. You should see it in more gardens. Well, yeah. I mean, is it something you can, it's quite easy to, you can get hold of today? Is oh, it? yes, yes. I mm. mean, we bought these plants in. It was um, you yeah. still see it around. You know, the summer one you tend to see as seed, so you grow that from seed. Yeah. Uh, but the winter one, as it's an evergreen, um, it's a small evergreen perennial, so it'll it'll stay green over the winter and give you a nice fresh fresh supply. Yeah. Yeah, this is something I'd like, quite like to know more about. Um, it's something we grew because it was on the, um, it was in this book of 1706, um, uh, the retired gardener, all about um, plants that were recommended by the head gardeners here, uh, and it's called sweet maudlin, which I think is a beautiful sounding <laughs> yeah. name. Um, and I think it's called that because it smells sweet, but the taste is bitter, so you've got sort of that sweet sadness. And answers on a postcard, please, for what you do with it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, because you don't know what it was used for. No, that's it. A lot of the time, we've got we've got these um, gardening books which reference um, reference these things to grow, but not yeah. necessarily things to do with them. It smells so, a little um, bit like rosemary, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. It's some, somewhere in between Sorry. the rosemary and that that tansy that we mm. said before. It's, it's sort of got sort of, again sort of daisy type flowers, isn't yes, it? Yes, again, it's in that daisy family. Yes. Its other name is English mace, but I think it smells mm. nothing like mace. Um, <laughs> right, let's have a look. There's so much there. here. Sort of yeah, quite, quite, aren't we? A bit. Uh, we see yeah. some of the um, the more familiar things here. Yes. Yeah, so again, we've got thyme, we've got parsley, yeah. we've got coriander, um, hyssop, hyssop, something which um, isn't so much used anymore. It's a lovely smell. <laughs> Quite an odd sort of hard to yeah, not, really, isn't not it? Yeah, I'm not saking on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put that in. I think some mm -hmm. of the, um, the historical cooks were making a, a chicken dish using a lot of hyssop to sort of flavour the, flavor oh. the broth. Okay. Mm -hmm. I suppose they were just just trying, seeing what went with different, you know, flavours of food and just... Yeah, it was what, what was available. I yeah. Think. I mean, um, the the spices would have been pretty expensive mm. uh, back in the day, so you'd, it was only the real rich, I'm sure, who could afford things like this. Yeah. So, um, so our homegrown herbs would have been a, bit, a lot more um, a lot more widely used. I think. So this is another one which, to our nose, might be a little bit odd. But this is um, this is called Cost Mary, and this would have been in every single kitchen garden um, up until mm. you know up the 16th, 17th century. And it has a very sort of um, it's sort of like a flowery, it's perfumey. Isn't yeah, it's, it? yeah, it's a perfumey. sort of flowery smell. Mm. And so this would have been used Ooh. as um, a flavouring for beer. So your beer, oh, would, okay. that's why it was in every single garden. It was probably before hops became widely used as a flavouring, people would have used this herb. Mm. I'm intrigued. I've never smelled that before. Yeah. Oh. Yes, it's, it's very quite hard to describe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not really. <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel like I'm sort of wine tasting or something, but um, <laughs> that's rather nice, though. Yeah. Yes, it does have a very sort of pleasant uh, aroma. And so the other name of this apparently was um, Bible leaf, because it was um, it keeps its it keeps its scent even when dried. It was used a lot in potpourri, but if you were to put a leaf in your Bible, it would keep the the bookworms away. Oh, <laughs> well that's an interesting. <laughs> Maybe I'll take this leaf home with me and yeah. put it in a book. <laughs> um, something else we've got here, which we don't tend to eat much now, is um, salad burnet, uh, and this is a wildflower that grows um, in the hills. Uh, particularly in hillsides, uh, but if you eat it, it has a slight cucumbery flavour. Mmm, yeah, it does, isn't it? Very unexpected in a leaf. Mm. Oh, it's quite nice. Mm. So yes, this would have been a popular salad ingredient. Yes, and here are some of those things that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, so this here is the heart's horn, uh, and something else I mentioned earlier was scurvy grass. Now, yeah, I'm hesitant to get you to try this, because it was really tasty in about... June time, end of May, June, but it's got hotter and hotter as the seasons progressed. So, um, try to be brave. It's like a horseradish type pot. Oh, right, so just okay. have a nibble at the edge of the leaf. Oh, <laughs> it's exactly. quite Again, yeah. it's, you don't really expect from a very sort of oh, innocuous mark. It's, it's, it's a vacuum of throat, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just the way horseradish does. But I think mm. they really, uh, catch up at the right time of year and it's delicious. Or maybe we'll try blanching it or something like that. Yeah. Maybe, you know, a lot of this is a bit of an experiment. Um, these crops, you know, haven't really been grown as eating crops, um, or they're not commonly grown as eating crops. So we're, we're still sort of finding out what the best things, yeah. are, best things to be doing with them. It's not how I imagined it would look, actually. I thought it'd be sort of more grassy. I know. It's, um, it's a bit of a, a lily, doesn't like a lily leaf, um, lily pad type. Um, a lily pad, yes. Mm. They're sort of like kid kidney shaped leaves. Yes. I think um, oh, and whereabouts have you? Whereabouts are the the melons you were talking about? Oh right, okay, yes. Maybe quite. Um, Let's strike out for the melon really. Yes, I must must see these early <laughs> early melons. <laughs> so this is a special 
fenced off area um, for growing melons and they would have fenced it off partly to keep wild animals out partly for you know I think it would have created a bit of extra heat but also it was said that um, to keep menstruating women out because it was said that they would ruin a crop of melons and keep <laughs> 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 Right, OK. <laughs> uh, and they would have been in raised beds like this? Yes. Okay. Um, they made raised beds so that they could add um, manure underneath. So underneath the soil la layer here, we've got about maybe 20 centimetres of soil and under that um, is some very fresh manure. So literally all the really strawy um, manure that's just been scraped out of the stable that day, yeah. uh, tipped into the bottom, uh, about a foot and a half deep. And as that breaks down, breaks down, that releases heat and it's that extra heat. It does feel quite um, warm. I don't yeah. know whether that's just my imagination, but it sort of feels... I think partly because we're in an enclosed area yeah. and we've got um, sort of gravel paths and we've yeah. got these wooden raised beds, you know, it just, the whole area definitely feels warmer. Mm. Um, and we've certainly had an excellent crop of melons this year. It does look like year. it, yeah. How much mm. did they have to get before you... Um, well, these are more or less, I think, right. Let's go and see if we can find one that will be uh, definitely right. I think these ones have been pretty good. So let's see, I just happen to have a knife in my pocket. <laughs> like all good gardeners. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they are quite small. The ones that will reliably ripen outside in this country tend to be pretty small. Mm. Um, there is even a type of melon called a Queen Anne pocket melon. Oh, so right. Have, um, and that was very small and they would have sort of used that partly for its perfume. Mm, for its oh, OK. From the, from the lovely smell of a, of a ripe melon. Um, but yes, it was a sign of prestige, really. You know, if you could afford to grow melons, it meant that you could afford to have a few gardeners and enough um, enough hotbed space to. Yeah, oh, thank you. Hmm. That's lovely. I think I've ever had a melon that's just literally just being picked. Yeah. Well, it is a, exactly. So there you go. You've got the sort of the luxury element. Mm. Of melon eating, you know, we take so many fruits and veg for granted nowadays. Yeah, we can just buy them in yes. wherever we want in the world. But you know, to, to someone who's never come across a melon before, this would be a, a real sort of luxury fruit. That was Vicky Cook, kitchen garden keeper at Hampton Court Palace. You can find out more about the Georgian Kitchen Garden at hrp.org.uk forward slash Hampton Court Palace. And you can also see a slideshow of images from the garden at historyextra.com forward slash Georgian hyphen garden. Since June this year, we've been running a series in the magazine entitled Our First World War, which recreates the events of a 100 years ago through the voices of those who were there. As regular listeners will know, we've also been including some audio clips from interviews by the Imperial War Museum within the podcast. This time, we move on to November 1914. Here is Royal Fusilier William Holbrook describing the death of a popular colonel around the time of the First Battle of Ypres. How, how, how did the colonel be killed? Kill. How, how did that happen? Did yes, you... No, I was about 20 yards, 30 yards along the line. And uh, the name Cheney, Corporal Cheney, I've never seen him since, I think he must have got killed afterwards. He came along and said, the colonel had been killed. Been killed? I said, didn't I? I said, no. I said, just long here. So he said, yes. God, he fucked the life out of me. I said, oh dear, what was I doing there? Because I looked at one of the father one, and he also know. And he got me his pocket, he gave me his pocket, but he taken it out of him. So I knew he was dead, so I didn't see him. And uh, he gave me his revolver. And then that way he didn't back further. So he, he got his body in though in the end. <coughs> He's got all his body. And um, we, uh, did it upset you greatly? I mean, you know, because this was a, a real friend of yours, aren't we? Not? Uh, Did it upset you a lot when the Colonel... Oh, yes. I didn't know what to do with myself for days. And neither the, neither the men were left either. They thought about him. They couldn't... Un it, it, when he got killed, as though somebody uh, uh, actually obliterated the whole battalion. Uh, absolutely dumbstruck. They couldn't understand it. They thought so much of him. And what what pleased me sometime after was I was in the tower on the for lunch and I heard two officers talking. And I heard them say, the finest battalion, they said, of our regiment, he said, was the 4th battalion. He said, the colonel, the, the kindest colonel we'll ever have, but we'll have his colonel McMahon. And I thought, well, you know, please me to hear that. So no, I didn't say anything, I just walked on, but these two officers were talking. They did the, the, the officers well, I thought the world of him. And now let's hear from George Wainford, who was serving aboard the British ship HMS Albemarle, 
and who recalled his experiences of filling the vessel with coal. Coaling ship was, I, I think, the bugbear of the whole business. Ninety percent of the lads aboard would definitely have preferred going into action than this incessant coaling. It was a filthy, dirty job, and perhaps you'd been to see three or four days, maybe the best part of a week, and you arrive late in the day and everybody was more or less tired out of being on watch and watch for all that time. But if there was a emergency on, you might have to call all night. And it was really, really tiring work. Now with the album out, you could at what they call they double bank the collier. In other words, you had a collier each side of you, one port, one starboard, and you're working flat out. The, the collier used to come with a coal in the coal right up to the combings, right up the top of the hatch. Well, the routine was for the seamen to go aboard and stand in the actual coal and you shovel it up and when you got perhaps ten bags they were put on a big board, square board and hoisted inboard and hour after hour you kept on filling these bags up until you gradually worked till you got right down and down and down and reached the deck it take hours and hours you occasionally stopped for a drink they used to make a barley water, big cans of it, we call them fannies, and, and lower them down and you should, because your mouth was full of coal dust, it was all over you. And I, I remember an occasion, we'd been at sea for a long time and we'd arrived late at night and, when well, I was only about 17 I suppose, and I was tired out, and the boy's job was to hold these bags up with an able seaman just shovel the coal in and you know great lumps of coal and I was really tired apparently and this is true and you might be apparently I was standing there and I must have gone to sleep standing up and I remember someone was sort of being half awake and half asleep and somebody saying Look at that poor little so-and-so, he's half asleep. And somebody shook me and I was standing up holding his bag, you know. I just couldn't keep awake. That was George Wainford. You'll find more from our First World War in each issue of BBC History magazine. And speaking of the magazine, our November issue is currently on sale. In this month's edition, you'll find articles on the Peasants' Revolt, Napoleon the Battle of the Bulge, and the History of Germany. You can get hold of the magazine in all good news agents and digitally. And now is also a great time to take out a subscription to the magazine. If you're in the UK, you'll get to choose a fantastic free history book when you subscribe, including new accounts of The Wars of the Roses, Thomas Cromwell and Waterloo. To take advantage of this deal, please visit historyextra.com forward slash subscribe and it will be available for a limited time only our last interview this week is with wilbur smith one of the world's best-selling historical novelists born in what is now zambia wilbur has been writing historical fiction for half a century and sold 120 million books in the process i met up with wilbur in london recently following the publication of his latest novel desert god an adventure set in ancient egypt and I began by asking him why he found this era to be such a rich source of inspiration. My first opportunity to travel out of Southern Africa to the UK for the publication of my first novel, I stopped over in Egypt, particularly to see the, the sites there and to see the um, temples, Karnak and, and the two Valley of the Kings, and the excitement stayed with me for the rest of my life. 
I went there just to see the Tutankhamun's tomb. I never thought that I would write a novel about it. But uh, in the in the process of time, I went r- repeatedly back to um, Egypt. And in fact, I also was got um, very interested in uh, Lawrence of Arabia. So I hired a, a caravan of four <laughs> camels and four drivers and we set off from Karnak, we went down the Red Sea, just through the desert. And I was nearly a month in the desert with these uh, people and just taking on board the excitement and the tranquility and the mystery of the, of the Sahara and of the Nile. And um, when the time came and I was ready, I wrote a book about it. So would you, would you say one of your main sources for writing these books is actually your own experiences and travels? It is. Because I set uh, when, uh, River God back in the time when uh, the Hyksos invasion of, uh, of Egypt threw it all into disarray. And there's, no, there's really no history of that period. So it gave me a free reign. So when people say, oh, it wasn't like that, I say, were you a Hyksos? Were you there? Because it was... Um, uh, you know, it's, it was a mysterious time and just suited very well my what I wanted to do with the story. How important do you think it is that a historical novel is historically accurate or is it more important to tell a really good story? Both are important. It's, it's important to get it right, as right as, as we know it to be. It's much easier if you're writing about the Tudors or something like that. It's very well documented. But it's also fun to imagine a period... Uh, of mystery in a place like Egypt, which is the beginning of history as we know it. They were the first people to invent writing. There was no written word before that. And uh, such skills as uh, archaeology and medicine, and they started everything going. Because of them, we are what we are. And you, you talked before about how you visit places and that helps you get the background to your books. Do you also read historic books as well to get a better understanding of period? I, I try to read histories um, written by people who, uh, who are working out, uh, people like Tom Holland and um, you know, Persian Fire and those sort of things. I, I read those, but not so much imaginative histories which are and a lot of guesswork involved. And one thing that, that in your books is very vivid is the battle scenes, the yes. fighting. Again, I mean, modern warfare is nothing like the kind of warfare you're describing. So how do you get yourself into the mindset or, and think about how those battles might have happened? Well, it's, it's, uh, for me it's fairly easy because you, we know what weapons they had. We even have examples of them from the, from the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun, for instance. The chariots and the... And the uh, spears and the arrows and the bows and arrows and then if you study that and know what they were capable of and they were fairly fairly uh, effective I mean the, the arrows uh, the uh, archery that was developed in those times and, and then you have the records they were fairly flimsy but you know the records of how they fought with the tribes around them and and dominated them and, and expanded and became one of the prevalent uh, peoples of ancient times. And you mentioned before that, that this period, right about this period of Egypt, has its advantages because um, we don't know as much about it perhaps. But is there another reason that, that you have drawn to this era? So many people write about, you know, Chief Khan and Nefertiti, but you've gone for a slightly less well known era. Well, uh, 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 for two reasons for that, but the main reason is because I am able to let my imagination have full reign, and I'm not restricted by the histories. If, uh, for instance, if we were writing about the the civil wars of, of the UK, it's all written down, so you you don't have the the latitude and uh, to let your imagination roam. And my, I have a, a very uh, lively imagination, put it that way. So you've, you've been writing historical novels 
for quite a few decades now and clearly one of the world's most successful mm. historical novelists. Why do you think your books are so popular? Why do they resonate with readers so much? I think my, my characters act like normal human beings and uh, they're believable and, and the people can identify with them. That's the main thing. And I mean, nowadays lots of people are writing historical fiction. What, what tips would you give them from your experience to, to be more successful in their own class? Find something new to write about. <laughs> because, um, yes, that's what I did with uh, the uh, Desert God series and the River God series was I found um, a niche in history which was had not been well documented and that uh, gave me a more latitude. Are there any other historical novels writing at the moment that you really admire? Them? I enjoy many of them and s some of them are uh, new writers uh, just breaking in. Uh, let me think, there's Giles Christian and then there's uh, established writers like uh, Tom Holland but it's such a wide field. There's so many people writing it. It's like anything. Pick your subject carefully, learn about it, and then expand it. That was Wilbur Smith. Desert God is out now in the UK, published by HarperCollins, and will be published in the US by William Morrow in the next few days. And that's almost all for this week. Do join us again next time when we'll be talking to Neil McGregor about the history of Germany and Giles Milton will be sharing some fascinating historical insights from his latest book. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook? where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast. 